thank you. So um, let me try to share my screen. I need um, I need I need some permission to share my screen. You should be able to share your screen now, Dr. Rasmani. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, just a moment. Can you see the slides now? Yeah, all good. Okay, so um, so my, uh, I will ask you to talk about a bit about space medicine and uh, a bit of, about my work. So I chose to give a kind of overview of uh, space cardiopulmonary physiology and the uh, extraterrestrial CPR. That's something that I've been working on for a long time now. Uh, so let me, it's blinking here, but I think that is okay. Uh, so uh, let's start with the, uh, to set the scene or you know, to see the scenario. Uh, I just a bit of, uh, uh, I don't know how much you know about space medicine. That's my, it was my issue when I was preparing the lecture. I don't know your background and how much you know about space physiology medicine. So I, I, I wanted to set the scene in terms of uh, uh, give the basics, let's say, of uh, space physiology and medicine, and then start uh, talking about, uh, in, uh, about cardiopulmonary physiology in space and my research in the extraterrestrial CPR. So first we need to understand the environment. You know, the, the astronaut is nowadays in a, in a much better environment than in begin, at the beginning of the space program. So if you take, for example, the Mercury, uh, uh, Gemini and Apollo missions, we, we had a very low uh, uh, atmospheric pressure, about five PSI. And then if you decrease pressure, you have to increase oxygen to avoid hypoxia mainly. And then it is, uh, uh, so the astronauts will be 100% oxygen. For the Skylab project, they adapt a bit the atmosphere. So it was 5%, uh, 5 PSI, but 70% oxygen and 30% nitrogen. And with the advent of the uh, space shuttle and nowadays the ISS, we can somehow mimic the atmosphere of Earth uh, with a barometric pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury, so 1 ATM. 20% oxygen, 8% nitrogen. CO2, have to, I have to confess, that's not very well controlled, can be 10 to 15 times higher than here, and it can have an impact on the well being and health of astronauts. Uh, but a part of that temperature, humidity, everything is, is very similar, it's very comfortable nowadays for the astronauts to be in space, except for, I would say, four main things uh, microgravity. Uh, radiation, some aspects related to the, to the psychology in space, to let's say uh, uh, psychosocial uh, aspects of a space mission, and the circadian rhythm that's very much disrupted in space, because as you should know, the uh, a spacecraft or a space station to orbit the Earth has to go at a speed of 20, 27,000 kilometers per hour which gives uh, 16 sunsets and 16 sunrises to the astronauts in 24 hours, because every, every an hour and a half, let's say, their the, the, the full orbit is completed. So we have lots of, let's say, disruptions of the everything related to the circadian rhythm in a 24 hour cycle. So if you want to, to follow the path of uh, space life science, space physiology, space medicine, these are the main four areas for lower uh, Earth orbit missions. Of course, if you go to Mars, to the moon, then you add other aspects because you are then going to uh, different places, different bo celestial bodies that will have their own characteristics in terms of gravity, exposure, or, 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 or the atmosphere itself, and so on. But now let's concentrate more in the LEO missions today. So if you, if you look at the... Um, uh, uh, what happens to uh, someone in space. You know, it was mentioned just before I started the lecture, a space motion sickness that really affects 70% of the astronauts, especially in the first three days of a flight. Well, we have changes in the uh, uh, calcium and the, and the bone mass we can, or muscle mass. So you have lots of different changes in our, our body, cardiovascular physiology, 
plasma volume that decreases as well, uh, radiation exposure, as I mentioned before. So every single cell in your body, every single system in your body is affected by being outside our planet. What is interesting is that it doesn't happen, uh, each system, let's say, would react in a different way. So this is, a, is an old picture, but it's, I like very much what it expresses because each line, each colorful line is one body system. And you can see that some respond very quickly and really adapt very quickly, like the new vestibular system, more related, as we mentioned, to space motion sickness. But you can see that cardiovascular or cardiopulmonary system is more like, say, it, it changes slower and adapts slower than the new vestibular system. And there are um, uh, body systems like muscles and bones that lose mass during uh, exposure to, to microgravity that never adapts, you know, or at least till, what, uh, till when we have the data, which is the longest stay in space, continuous stay in space was 428 days of Valery Polyakov, a cosmonaut, a Russian cosmonaut. So what we know is basically to that level, to that point. But uh, we, we, we are aware that the muscles and bones are completely, uh, let's say, uh, affected by microgravity continuously as radiation, the effects of radiation. So when you look at, uh, when you talk about a body system in space, or when you, if you want to research about that, you need to know this timeline of how, uh, how much and when these uh, systems are more affected and when they really adapt. Uh, I divided, it's my division, it's my, my idea. So please uh, <laughs> uh, don't take it uh, as a, a scientific review, a systematic review of the literature. Uh, I, I think that we can divide space medicine in three main areas. We have uh, these uh, effects of, as I mentioned, of micrograph radiation, psychosocial aspects, circadian rhythms, and CO2 as well, uh, the level of CO2. And it will affect our body if you want or not in terms of um, psychology and physiology. So when you astronauts are in space, they will change their, their physiology, their anatomy, their psychology. And this is a, a very interesting area of medicine uh, or, or of space life science that you can dedicate to yourself if you, if you want to follow this path. There are other two types of medicine that I would like to call the, your attention. What I, what I call operational medicine, because it's related to the logistics and, the, and um, uh, say the, uh, the timetable of activities that you astronauts have to perform in a space mission. Could be exercise, could be meals, prepare meals, eating meals, sleeping, um, perform experiments and so on and so forth. So uh, extravehicular <coughs> activities. So it's more operational medicine. It is related to your staying in a place. Uh, so how you have your personal hygiene, for example, or how you go to the toilet, and all that things that can affect the astronauts, the well-being of the astronauts, and even their health. And then I call, uh, I think that there is a third, uh, third uh, aspect here is clinical medicine. So you have this adaptation or, or this acclimatization to uh, to a space environment you know, due to microgravity and so on and so forth that uh, we discussed it before. But we uh, can have on top of that, you can have a disease, an expression of, uh, uh, for example, a respiratory infection or a urinary tract infection, or you can have an accident, uh, trauma. So this is more clinical medicine. And this is more related to people that work in um, space agents that you have direct contact with the astronauts before flight, during flight, and after flight in terms of medical uh, management, you know, uh, health management in the sense of diseases, of trauma, accidents. So if you are uh, going to follow this path, I think that the most, most of you become a space psychologist or psychiatrist or a space physiologist in different areas. Uh, this is really the bulk of the of space research if you go to check papers in you know, everywhere, it's going to be much more related to that. Operational medicine, you don't find much in the literature, which is more, as I said, the operational aspects is um, the logistic aspects of structuring a space mission that can have an impact of the health and well-being of astronauts. So, but let's focus on the cardiopulmonary system. 
and I divided basically in the cardiovascular system first and then the, the respiratory system after that. I have to call, say that during my PhD here at King's College, I had um, my, my team, my, 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 the top of my thesis was a, a lung function in a microgravity simulation. Uh, we measure uh, many different things. But in any case, uh, let's start with the cardiovascular physiology first. I'm pretty much uh, sure that you are uh, I think it's that here. Uh, pretty much sure that you are aware of uh, these uh, four men. <laughs> uh, the first one is here on Earth with the heart, in the, you know, the chest, and then the distribution of blood from uh, head to toe. And you can see that as soon as you are in microgravity, the second doll here, the second uh, uh, man here, we have an enlargement of the heart, and then you have more blood in the upper body because of the lack of the uh, endostatic pre uh, pressure due to the lack of gravity. And then you have a moment in space that you are apparently, you know, nowadays we have some questions about that, but it was believed for many, many years that you adapted after a while, uh, sometimes seven days, two weeks, uh, could be a bit longer, could be even a bit less. It, it has a, a huge uh, variation, you know, individual variation. You need to remember that uh, uh, about 600 people went into space. And then here I want to have a bracket saying that uh, it's a bit less than 600, but let's say 600 to round the number. Uh, and uh, only 12% are, are women. So every, no, everything that we know about, in fact, about space physiology is much more related to, I would say, male <laughs> space physiology. Uh, it is more like, let's say, the, the, the the, the knowledge that we have is much more related to male volunteers as astronauts in space performing uh, experiments. But let's go from the, the, the man number three to number four here. You can see that the heart is a bit smaller than when he left Earth in the, you know, if you compare to man number one. And then blood is back to, uh, uh, to the lower limbs or to the lower part of the body. And then you can compare uh, the, the, the top part that has less blood circulating, which can be, which is one of the, let's say, cause for orthostatic intolerance. And I like very much these two pictures here, you know, the, the, the data itself, because it shows both the top part, you know, of the, of this, this uh, called puffy face and bird legs syndrome, puffy face, because you have more blood in the upper body, you know, you are, you are, uh, head is, uh, your face is more rounded. And then the bird legs or chicken legs are also called chicken legs because your legs you know, have this uh, decrease in volume due to the blood shift to the upper body. So here you can see that uh, the pre-flight, you know, so it's 100%, so that's control. Uh, it, this is an echocardiographic data from the left ventricular and diastolic volume that was measured in space. And then you can see that Friday one, there is an increase in the heart size. And then it adapts. And you can see that in day five or six, it's even below the, the, the control level. So you have another, uh, uh, an increase of about, let's say, 20%, you know, 120 here. And then a decrease of almost 20%. So you have a huge shift. And then it stays, it stays uh, apparent you know, in a kind of um, plateau. But it was a short mission because the post flight was really uh, showing the same changes as the, the during flight. So, it, but you can see here the change in the, the, the heart, let's say, heart side of this uh, cardiovascular adaptation. And this other figure here is about the legs. So, uh, even here on Earth, so pre flight, you now if you are in the supine position, of course, because of gravity, you know, you you shift a bit of your blood from your legs, and then uh, it is less, let's say the volume of the leg is less than in the standing position. If you are in flight, you can see the decrease in the legs uh, volume uh, from flight day zero to flight day, flight day uh, six. And then when you come back to Earth, you have the same pattern that you had before, but with less volume. So I think that this, uh, this is very good to summarize uh, these three pictures, you now if you understand that, you basically summarize a very, a very important aspect of what we know of how the cardiovascular system adapts to, uh, to space. 
uh, what is expected then was was expected is that the uh, center of venous pressure would increase in space because you have um, uh, more blood let's say in the upper body you know the upper um, uh, in, in, yeah, in the upper body uh, so more 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 blood filling the heart the preload increases so you are wow, you are going to have an increase in the in the, car, in the um, uh, center of venous pressure so some uh, astronauts had the, the center of venous pressure measured in space. Not many, I think that just three, one during the, yeah, three subjects, sorry. One was in the Space Life Science 1 mission and the, the two others in the Space Life Science 2 mission. And uh, they measured pre-flight and uh, immediately during the insertion in microgravity. We can see here that uh, if you are seated before flight, you have a normal um, a CVP, you know, and then when you are, uh, at least during the shuttle program that the astronauts had to be lying on their back with the, uh, with the legs up. So you had a shift of blood towards your chest. You had an increase uh, to 15. And then immediately after insertion in, in microgravity, you have a decrease to um, 2.5 or, or 0 to 2.5. You know, and it persists after 10 minutes. So this was a huge, uh, let's say, headache for the, 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 the cardiovascular physiologists, you know, space physiologists, because it was expected it to go up and it, it comes down. So the left ventricular and diastolic dimension measured, as I, as I showed you by echocardiogram, increased you know, a bit to almost five centimeters from 4.6 to almost five centimeters. But the CVP uh, decreased, although there is an increased feeling of the, the, the heart. So what was, um, let's say, extracted from that is that possibly there is um, the fall of the CVP uh, is a change in the relationship between the CVP and the actual transmural left ventricular feeling pressure, which might be altered in microgravity. Uh, is it still something that is under the study, but it is, uh, uh, let's say, the best type of explanation. And I leave you here two uh, important uh, reference for for the CVP in space. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Burke Jr. Jun, uh, Jr. in 85 and then in 96. Uh, it, it is very interesting. And I say that's very interesting to learn a, a bit about central venous pressure and, uh, and uh, the distribution of blood and so on, because we simulate here on Earth uh, the cardiopulmonary system by tilting someone's head down. But as you could see here, by just having the legs up, we increase the, in, the central venous pressure. So my question is how much you are simulating what happens in space when you tilt someone head down, which is a technique used all over the world by all space agents. Now, ideally six degree head down is the, 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 the number you know, that everybody tends to use. Uh, and there is a story behind that, but I don't have the time to tell you, but in any case, uh, if you tilt someone head down here on Earth, you are going to have an increase in the, in the cardiovascular, in the um, central venous pressure, which would change the, the whole physiology. So can we really compare our results on Earth with the results in space? So that's a good question to answer someday. Uh, in terms of the plasma and blood volume in space, you know, it is quite interesting again, because at first it was understood that the... the, the the, the decrease in the, the plasma volume, which is decreased about between, depending on the study, between 20, 12 and 20 percent, was, uh, the, was re, a result of the increase in the preload, you know, the, 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 the Gower Henry reflex uh, that would stimulate you know, the, the, the decrease in the, the plasma volume. Uh, but it doesn't happen, as you know, CVP does not increase, so there is no stimulation of this reflex. So there is really a negative balance uh, that uh, is um, reduced the urine uh, during the first day. So initially it was uh, believed that that's also to increase the urine output in the beginning of the space flight, but it's a there is a reduction in the urine output, uh, with the, uh, which is also related to the decrease in food intake and sometimes with space motion sickness that can be severe enough for the astronaut not to eat, not to drink, and also vomit a lot. So this is was the first you know, explanation when we start seeing the reduction of urine output. But then CVP was um, uh, identified to be decreasing in flight. And then uh, the idea was that the food shifts from the intravascular um, 
the, the, fluid sh sh the fluid, sorry, shifts from the intravascular to the inter interstitial space. Uh, and as a result, it lowers the transmural pressure after reducing compression of all tissues by gravitational force, especially the thorax cage. So you have this decreasing pressure uh, on the tissues that, the, that change, let's say, the transmural pressure. And also to the muscles, now the fluid can shift to the muscle interstitial space as well, because again, less muscle tone is required to keep, uh, keep the astronauts, uh, 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 the body portion of astronauts, because they don't stay in the standing position, basically. And there is also a decrease in erythrocytes because there is a decrease in erythropoietin production. Uh, it is believed that because it is connected to the, this decreasing plasma volume, increasing the hematocrite and then decreasing the production of uh, erythropoietin and therefore the uh, electros, um, erythrocytes. Uh, here again, I leave a, a very important and a very good uh, um, reference for that uh, area. Uh, what is also interesting is that the uh, if you look at this figure here, oops, what happened? Someone, uh, well, uh, I don't know. Sorry, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. But so, if you look at this um, this figure here, it's very important to understand something that uh, I I found it very curious when I. I came across this uh, data, not just this one specific, but data re related to the supine position in microgravity. And you are going to see that it, re it also is, um, it also happens during um, uh, uh, lung function, let's say lung function in space. It's also interesting to compare supine and uh, microgravity because here you can see that cardiac output after six, seven days in, in microgravity. Uh, you can see the seat, seat position, and then you can see that, of course, it's less than the supine position. But you can see that in microgravity, it stays in between seat, uh, the seat position and the uh, supine position. Uh, for the uh, vascular resistance, we can see it again. Of course, the vascular re resistance will be greater during seat position, and uh, but the, the supine is going to be, of course, less than that. Uh, if you compare to the seat position, but again, microgravity stays in between. So to stay in the supine position somehow is more uh, in, in stressful or, 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 or the chains are more pronounced than in microgravity itself. So it's uh, quite an interesting uh, finding. And if you go to pressures, you know, the, the pressures that we, uh, the blood pressure, for example, or the intraocular pressure, intracranial pressure, we can see that uh, nowadays we know a bit more about that. In the past, it was uh, a bit like a blurred uh, area. Now, uh, it was estimated that in microgravity we have a, a, a no gradient from head to toe of, uh, of pressures, both in the uh, arterial side and the venous side. So if you look at, uh, here at, the, at these studies, done by the Russians and the Germans in space related to the intraocular pressure, we can see that there is an increase, you know, about 114 to 19%. This is, these two white bars here are uh, based on the data from space missions. And this was collected after 30, uh, uh, sorry, after 15 minutes insertion in microgravity. So uh, let's mean that to 100, you know, so 100% change in, um, in the, in the intraocular pressure in space, there is an increase. So people with glaucoma, of course, or people with a history of glaucoma in the family might be excluded from a flight, uh, at least as an astronaut, maybe not as a space tourist, uh, that's another discussion, but because there is an increase, a trans transitory increase in the intraocular pressure in space. Uh, I mentioned to you that uh, for the cardiovascular system or you know, in general uh, in micrograph simulation using head down tilt, the angle is six degrees. So I did a, a quick study in Brazil looking at the uh, ocular pressure uh, change during in 15 minutes of uh, head down tilt. And I used different angles to get to the one that would be more or less simulating what happens in space in 15 minutes. And it's not six degree, not 12, not 18, but we need 34 degrees. So this is a good lesson that is, uh, if you want to design a protocol, you need to know 
uh, the angle that you're going to use because it will be uh, the affecting the, the, the body system that you are studying. So it's the body system, the angle that you are using the time of exposure. So you always have to have that in your mind. And these are the, the reference papers for these two missions. Um, sorry. Uh, so more recently, it was seen that there is this uh, uh, space, um, uh, um, this change in the ocular pressure, uh, sorry, in the intracranial pressure due to the exposure of microgravity. So space flight associated neuroocular syndrome or SANS, and uh, it affects male astronauts, not female astronauts until now at least. Uh, not all of the astronauts, but a, a good number of astronauts could be related to the headward shift of blood to the, due to microgravity, could be maybe genetics, we don't know. Uh, CO2 levels could have an effect because it interferes with the vasculature in the brain in terms of vasoconstriction and vasodilation, or can be uh, related to ocular and brain changes. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, first identified as a change in the, in the, in the, in the, um, global, you know, the, the eye itself and the, and the optic nerve. And uh, that there was never a collection of um, um, puncture of the spine to collect, to, to, to check for the blood, to, for the intracranial pressure. Uh, but it was done after flight. And uh, even after flight, even two weeks or two weeks after flight, the intracranial pressure was still up. So is it similar to high, idiopathic intracranial, uh, idiopathic, uh, intracranial hypertension? Now, this is something that uh, could help you know, understand a bit the pathophysiology of this uh, uh, situation. But if you compare these two, you know, we can see that it is not really the case as it is, the, of course, the intracranial pressure is, uh, is increased. Um, Although it's not measured in space, but let's say that with the data that you have after flight, we agree that it is the intracranial pressure is increased. It's more in men than uh, it, uh, the the uh, idiopathic hypertension is more in female uh, patients than male patients. So it's completely the opposite. Uh, and then you have you no know, characteristics of the person itself, like to be obese or not obese, and of course astronauts are not obese and also the change that you can find uh, in the eye uh, during uh, clinical uh, checks. You know? So we can see that, for example, the choroidal folds are, uh, also are different than in, in microgravity. So it is not similar. Unfortunately, we cannot learn through what we know in relation to this um, idiopathic uh, intracranial pressure increase. Um, this is, a, this is a very interesting picture because this is an MRI after six days post flight. And you can see that there is a persistence of this, uh, this uh, change in the globe, this flattening of the globe. And uh, uh, can resolve post flight, of course, but it can also persist. And there are some data that could persist for over ten, uh, seven years. More recently, in relation to the cardiovascular system, it was identified that the uh, the, the flow, let's say, between the head and the heart, you know, through the, the jugular veins, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't happen as it should. It can have a, a stasis, so it's not flowing, and it can then, of course, um, uh, promote the formation of uh, thrombosis, and this happened in space, and it was treated in space. Uh, this is the reference paper, it's for 2019, so quite recent. But because of that, many other studies were uh, carried on in head down tilt, in parabolic flights, and in space. And some show that uh, not even not, not that the blood, the uh, the venous flow was not flowing, let's say, from head to heart. But sometimes it was head uh, heart to head, and sometimes it was just uh, you know not flowing at all. So this is a very uh, top, uh, very hot topic now. And this is something that can be uh, studied in universities because you just need uh, a good way to evaluate the jugular veins and the heart and the head down to the situation. Although, as we know now, um, the pressures uh, are not necessarily the same as in space. And then, of course, remember then that for uh, men, you know, when you come back to Earth, you know, the post-flight, uh, your exercise capacity is decreased. 
you have a, a good chance for orthostatic intolerance uh, when you stand up here on Earth and gravity uh, redistribute the blood and, and fluids again from the um, upper body to the lower body. So your heart is a bit smaller, you have a, a less plasma volume, your baroreceptors have not basically uh, worked in space unless when you were exercising that you could increase blood pressure and then stimulate the, the, the baroreceptors. But by changing positions in space, there is no activation of the baroreflex. We have uh, in space, it's seen also that there is a kind of co uh, chronic vasodilating state, not well understood uh, completely. And also for the orthocyte intolerance, we're gonna have alterations in your um, coordination, your vestibular system, uh, you are gonna have less bones and less muscle. So uh, maybe come back with a space anemia still, although sometimes it is resolved during flight. So uh, of course it will depend on the duration of exposure to microgravity. If you perform a countermeasure, especially the exercise countermeasures 2.5 hours per day for six days, using a red uh, psychoergomet and treadmill. And of course, there is also an individual variation. So there are ways to try to compensate that. No, I think that someone was mentioning uh, or was asking about artificial gravity. Yes, it might be a solution. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe, maybe not. No, we need to test that because there are other aspects involved. Uh, physical training, of course, that's I just mentioned exercise. You have to drink lots of fluids before re-entering the atmosphere to make sure that you have more, let's say, liquid in your body circulating. Uh, you can use anti-G suits during and after re-entry. That's another way to compensate for that. And some type, sometimes you can try the more uh, severe case use for uh, some pharmacology, you know, some uh, medicines. So this is uh, what I wanted to summarize in terms of uh, cardiovascular physiology. Now going to the lung function in space, which is, um, I would start with lung volumes and capacity because that was something that was considered many, many years uh, ago, just a bit after the, the first flight of Gagarin in 1961. This is the raw data, the, 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 the original data, sorry, from um, uh, 1964, showing already the, 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 the the idea that by changing positions, you know, the body positions, you are going to change the volume, uh, lung volumes and capacities. So here you can have someone standing or inclined 70 degrees about supine, and then two head down uh, experiments. So you can see that there is an effect you know, uh, in, in different um, uh, lung volumes and capacity, but I will summarize that for you using the data from the space itself. So you have here uh, that when you are in space, the chest wall changes, it goes outward and upward. So it's like a more a pigeon chest. And of course it increases the diameter of the rib cage. Uh, the diaphragm and the abdominal contents uh, move upwards. So affecting also the lung, lung volume. So in 1994, you know, the beginning of 1990s, there was many uh, lung function studies were uh, performed and um, in space and my in and in parabolic flights and in general terms i can tell you that there is a decrease in lung function uh, in lung volume sorry and capacities of about 20 percent when you are in space that varies from 15 10 to 20 percent but let's say that 20 percent is the magic number uh when you are in microgravity and hypergravity of a parabolic i'm oh, sorry of a parabolic flight you have the the, the chains that are expected and also when you are in microgravity you have this uh, abdominal content diaphragm going up and so you reduce the uh, lung volumes and when you are in micro in hypergravity you stretch your body so you have an increase in the in the lung volumes and capacities so in microgravity there is, uh, in this experiment here in the kc 135 aircraft there was a decrease of 432 or 400 let's say ml uh, in microgravity and about 200 in hypergravity. So an increase of 200 in microgravity, in hypergravity. So here it is, a, a, it's a very good way. You know, this slide shows that uh, we have, uh, we are really affected by gravity when you talk about lung volumes and capacities, either micro or hypergravity. Uh, 
What is again interesting is that, as I mentioned before, there is this, um, uh, if, you if you compare standing microgravity and supine, microgravity is between standing and supine. So it means that it's not that stressful <laughs> for the, the, the lung volume and capacity, because as soon as you are in, in a, in a um, uh, supine position, you also have this type of effect that is similar or even uh, a bit less than, a bit more intense than microgravity. But what is the most important thing for the lungs? It's not just the volumes and capacity, but it is how it functions in terms of uh, distribution uh, of perfusion and ventilation, because this will be extremely important for the uh, exchange of oxygen between the lungs and the, the capillaries, you know, the, 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 the pulmonary capillary system. So you have here the distribution in the upper right lung of the of perfusion. So going from top to bottom, you have more, let's say, blood uh, in the bottom part. The same happens to ventilation, and here you can see that this is um, this is um, uh, a, a lung unit, you know, with, that is bigger, let's say, than the the bottom one. But ventilation is not about the size; it's about the change of volume per time. So if you, when you ventilate your lung, because you have a less, uh, let's say, um, the, a smaller size at the bottom of your lung, then your change will be much pronounced in terms of uh, expansion than at the upper side, which means that ventilation will be increased as well in the uh, bottom of the, the lung in, in relation to the top of the lung. And here is a summary of that, you no? Know? So uh, this is the lung base, this is the lung apex or top. So you have the blood flow or perfusion going from uh, 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 being, let's say, much more at the bottom than at the top. And the same for the ventilation, but you can see that they change in, in a different type of intensity. And this is the VAQ that has a, um, a better, let's say, uh, correlation at about the third rib, which is, uh, VAQ of one, which means that for, let's say, each lung unit that has air inside and O2, you have a capillary there waiting for the exchange. So this is uh, what is happening here on Earth, and here is just a representation. Imagine that my bottle uh, is a lung and that the liquid inside is uh, blood, no perfusion. And you can see that it doesn't matter, but by changing it, we can change the uh, distribution of perfusion. In space was accepted that uh, we are, would have um, uh, a better distribution or a, a homogeneous distribution, even, uh, uh, even as distribution of perfusion and ventilation. So not just in the third rib, we are, rib you are going to have a, a VAQ, VAQ of one, but in the entire uh, lung. And uh, surprisingly enough, it was used uh, cardiogenic oscillations, cardiogenic oscillation of CO2 for perfusion and cardiogenic oscillation of argon and nitrogen for ventilation. Uh, so perfusion with CO2 cardiogenic oscillation show that although it decreases a lot, you no, know, it still persists. So there are other mechanisms involved in distribution of the, the blood in the lungs, the perfusion in the lungs that are, it is not related to gravity. Could it be central peripheral difference in blood flow? Possibly. This is what the authors believe. So here you have the original paper, CO2, you no know, cardiogenic oscillations. And in microgravity, you see that you still have a persistence, a persistent cardiogenic oscillation. The same happened to uh, argon and nitrogen that are used to, che to check for ventilation. And um, they also showed in space that uh, uh, there was a persistence of cardiogenic oscillation of about 44% uh, for nitrogen, 24% for uh, argon. And uh, maybe it's related to regional difference in lung compliance, airway resistance, the motion of the chest wall and diaphragm. So it is still a bit of a question mark, but here you can see that uh, you have the standing supine in micro G and you still have, you uh, know, there is no, it's not zero. It's not, uh, it doesn't disappear these, um, the cardiogenic oscillations. So what was concluded by that is that uh, the PO2 uh, in, the, in the lungs and the arteries have normal difference of eight millimeters of mercury. So if you have, let's say 108 
minimizam o Mercúrio em Orlã e agora é a renda de melhor a capilares, não em or, a uh, arterial side. Uh, what we can say is that uh, uh, this is caused by shunt, no? this, this difference, by, um, and by the, this um, uh, unevenness distribution of perfusion ventilation. So by decreasing that, no, uh, taking out four millimeters of mercury difference of this uh, difference between perfusion and ventilation, we will end up with a, 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 less, no, a, a lesser difference between uh, our, uh, PO, PO2, alveolar PO2 and arterial PO2. But uh, VO2Q is close, but is still different from one. It's not what was predicted before. And then there was another question. Oh, but uh, if you have this shift of blood to the, to the upper body, maybe you have a kind of a pulmonary um, uh, edema of the, of the pulmonary uh, membrane. So it was, if, in fact, speculated by, in, by uh, Permut in 1967, and it was tested almost 30 years later uh, in a nine-day mission in space. And it is interesting, the results. Now, if you look here, you can see that, uh, let me just, oh, sorry, just, uh, just explain because I want you to pay attention to what is important in this figure. This, this first uh, part of the figure shows the change between standing and supine. So by going standing to supine, of course, I have more blood going to my lungs. So venous return increases, and then it recruits more and extend more capillaries. But there is the anterior part of the lung, because I'm in the supine position, that is less ventilated and perfused. So you can see here that the amount of um, uh, uh, volume of blood in the pulmonary capillaries increased a lot from standing to supine, but the membrane itself does not change much, the, the, the diffusion capacity of the membrane, because you still have this area that's gravity dependent on us. If you go to the next slide here, you can see the, from standing to microgravity. And then you can see again that there was a huge increase in the venous uh, return. So the, 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 the volume of uh, blood in the pulmonary capillaries increased, but it also increased a lot the pulmonary, uh, the uh, membrane diffusion capacity because uh, you increase a lot the surface area of blood gas barrier uh, and it uh, has a more uniform uh, distribution of blood, so it, it, there is a this substantial increase of uh, membrane uh, of this um, uh, membrane diffusion capacity. So in general terms, for the, car, for the lung system, the, the pulmonary system, microgravity does not uh, uh, impair, let's say, the, the function of lungs. Uh, it, is, it decreases a bit uh, pulmonary capacities and, uh, and volumes, as I mentioned, but it doesn't have any repercussion, clinical repercussion, because there is a better distribution of perfusion ventilation, although not as, uh, not as even as expected. There is some minor changes still there. And you have a better, there is no edema, and you have a better um, area for, let's say, exchange of uh, O2. So you are pretty much protected in terms of, um, of, um, uh, uh, the, uh, in relation to the, car, the, the pulmonary system. One area that I worked very, uh, very much during my terrestrial, let's say, medical life, uh, I was working in intensive care units and, um, and uh, emergency rooms. So I was, of course, facing CPR very commonly, you know, uh, not every day, but me very, uh, it was a, a very common situation that I was involved with. So I, bring, I, I tried to merge a bit of my knowledge of CPR to space. We know that it's, nobody had a cardiac arrest in space, but some point in time it might happen and um, with astronauts and even more likely to happen with space tourists that are less fit, are older, uh, possibly sick with med chronic medications and, uh, and so on. So here uh, I will present a bit of my, my experience. Of course, carcinoma resuscitation, everybody's aware of that, is, um, is, a, is a terrible emergence that you have to face. You have you know, to act as quick as possible, chest compression, artificial ventilation to prevent uh, brain damage and also uh, cardiovascular damage. 
So my first experiment was in uh, with Simon and Lisa Evitz. Uh, we developed the uh, Evitz Husomano CPR technique, which was um, uh, tested in a parabolic flight in, in Bordeaux, France in 2000. Uh, you should know about parabolic flights. You go up and down and you have a period of microgravity that is about 20 seconds and you have three days of flight. And uh, in each day you have 30 parabolas that are divided in six sets of five parabolas each. And you have intervals between these sets of parabolas to basically change your um, equipment, calibrate equipment, change subjects, whatever you need to do. So NASA uh, has two main top, uh, two main uh, CPR techniques, reverse bear hug and handstand. And we had, had this, um, uh, the, we developed this technique called the Evitz Husumano CPR method, which is, uh, it's basically the first aid. Imagine that you are, you are a doctor, you have this astronaut having this cardiac arrest. You have to start immediately before we deploy restraint systems or, or machines or medication, uh, you need to do something because it might take three, four minutes or, or maybe even more than that, but let's say that up to four minutes for uh, the scene of CPR to be established. And uh, considering now the, the, the size of the space station might take even longer. Uh, so this technique, you can basically embrace your, uh, the, the victim, <laughs> the patient with your legs, with your left leg around the right shoulder and the right leg around the torso, having the chest free for massage and also you can um, uh, perform mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation if you need it. This is the first aid, no restraint system, no medication, no equipment, nothing. Uh, so it is, we had this, um, this setup in the, in the parabolic flight. We have our bay you know, to number five to, to, to work. Uh, let me see if I have a, I think that I have a movie here. Just Prof. Tice, there's five minutes left, just by the way. Okay, it's very quickly. Uh, so here you have the airplane going up and down. And then you have this moment of microgravity, you know, that uh, some just enjoy it and some work <laughs> during this period. It's very good to enjoy, in fact. It's a really very different situation. And I just want to show, uh, we are performing the massage you now here. Very difficult to perform the massage because uh, uh, you, you don't have the weight of your body. And here again, it's me performing the massage. So this is the, the view that I want to show. So we were very happy to our results compared to the handstand and reverse bear hug. But then we know that 20 seconds is not enough. So we try to expand that comparing different techniques of CPR. So we develop a body suspension system in Brazil to perform CPR in microgravity and hypogravity simulation. So here you have the Evitz Sumano. Here you can have the uh, show how you do the reverse bear hug. And of course, for the handstand, you had to use a trolley to help with the, 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 the technique itself or to mimic the technique. What's important here is that it's very tiring to perform CPR in microgravity, extremely tiring microgravity and microgravity simulation. We can see that the Borg scale here at 1G is about 9, 10, and in microgravity is about 16, 17, 18. And also you have to bend your arms to compensate for the lack of uh, weight. So you have about uh, uh, an angle of about 15 degrees to perform that. So you just compare the techniques, I'm going to just pass that, just to go to the hypog simulation using the same uh, device. And you can then calculate your body weight to simulate Mars or the moon in terms of uh, uh, CPR. They, uh, and this is very interesting because this, uh, we compare two groups, uh, female and male data. And you can see that as um, gravity decreases, let's say from this control, which is 1G, we create a planet X, which is uh, something uh, hypothetical, and Mars and Moon. And you can see that the mean de depth of chest compression decreases as microgravity decreases. The same for the, 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 the uh, um, compression rate. And the angle will increase. So we will increase the angle of chest comp for chest compressions to be uh, you know, achievable uh, in a good term. 
of course, at that time, it was 40 to 50, not 50 to 60. And here you can see the male data. So to be stronger or to be bigger might help, although you will still compensate the lack of weight by bending the arms. Uh, so I just want to leave with this. Um, uh, you can go to the homepage of Nov Space, go to library, and then you have this uh, free chapter of a book that Lucas and I wrote. And there is another one about parabolic flies that might interest you. And it's about everything that I mentioned about the cardiopulmonary uh, revision, uh, space uh, physiology, you know, and also a uh, lot about the CPR and our studies in, in microgravity. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Prof. Thais. That was a really uh, great talk. It was really in depth as well. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, we'll just uh, wait if there's any questions uh, from the audience. Yeah, I, 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 I thought to do something more superficial and more, um, you know, uh, but I, I think that's an opportunity for, for you to know every single aspect of different areas, cardiovascular system, uh, pulmonary system, and also uh, studies related, let's say, to CPR here on Earth. Obrigado. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, the CPR aspect was very interesting. Um, I'd never really thought about doing CPR in space before. Um, there's one question in the chat. Someone would like to know, um, they, they say, um, it makes sense why left ventricular and diastolic volume decreases after some time, but why would it increase on the first day? And what's that in response to? Okay, the first day it increases because you have this shift of blood towards the chest and then it enlarges the heart. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Um, Sorry? Okay, that's cool. So you have a, a, an area of space medicine at UCL? Um, we have a small division of space medicine. Okay. I'm glad to contribute with um, more lectures or, or research ideas or to talk more about research itself, you know, that I have a huge experience, over 30 years experience researching in this area. So uh, I'd, be very, I'd be very happy to, to, do, to contribute somehow. Thank you so much for that offer. Uh, there's one more question. Does the heart work harder in microgravity? Uh, what is that? Um, uh, does the heart the work harder? Uh, not necessarily harder, in fact, because uh, you, you remember that here on Earth, we have to send blood to the upper body, which is against gravity. And in, in microgravity, you don't have to do that. So it's, uh, uh, I don't think that it, the heart works harder. Uh, there's one more. Would the use of a Lucas device be more efficient for extraterrestrial CPR? For sure. But again, you need to have, you need to remember that you need time to deploy something. It's very, everything is very difficult in microgravity to take something, to move something around, to place it, to restrain the person on the floor and so on. So that's why you develop the Avid Susuman technique, which will be the first. So why are you doing the Avid Susuman? You can do whatever, deploy the Lucas medication, restraint systems and the things like that. But to, uh, any minute for the brain is a lot, you no, know, without blood, it's a lot. It can you can revive the person, but the roof is gone. No? There's a lot of people attending. 100 some, 139. Um, so I, I, I hope you have enjoyed. I didn't, I didn't want to bother you with lots of data, but at the same time, it's an opportunity for you to learn. I think, and they have the best reference papers for the different areas. Um, so. I, uh, I think there's one more question before you go uh, from Aaron. Does the ejection fraction also change with the change? In, I, uh, I am not sure. I think that wh when you ask that, you need to see when the paper was, um, was done, no? If they measure, I believe that they measure that, but it's you never know. I have to revise that. 
but you have to remember that it's not, uh, it will change, I believe, but you change as uh, the, um, uh, as the adaptation happens. In the beginning, let's say the first two or three days, it's going to be one scenario, but as, as, as time goes by, it's going to adapt and then you are gonna have a more stable and um, uh, uh, ejection fraction. For sure, it doesn't decrease to, because you have more blood uh, and also because uh, there is no signs or symptoms of uh, a decrease of uh, ejection fraction. So it is, uh, I think that it is go up, it goes up, but I have to check the paper for that to make sure that that's the case. That's a good question. So you have lectures and uh, like that during your in your center there. Uh, so actually, it's it's not part of the curriculum. That's why uh, this we're organizing this conference. It's a it's a flavor of space medicine for people. I think that's all the questions. Uh, so thank you so much once again um, for bringing your expertise to us, and we really enjoyed uh, hearing from you. Okay, thank you for inviting me and uh, good luck with your space medicine conference. Bye bye. Um, so I just like to introduce our next speaker, which is Dr. Tara Castlebury. And she completed her medical training from Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine in Missouri. And she served as a flight surgeon for NASA, providing medical support for ISS missions and astronaut training in Star City, Russia. Dr. Tara was a deputy crew surgeon for NASA expeditions, 1331. And in 2015, she joined the Virgin Galactic and is now their chief medical officer. So yeah, I'd just like to introduce um, her. So, um, uh, yep, Dr. Katara, Tara's call, um, talk is pre-recorded, uh, so unfortunately there won't be an opportunity to ask questions. However, at the end of the talk, she does give her email address, uh, so you can ask um, for emails. And we'll sort out QR codes in a second as well, so just bear with me as I, as I share her talk. Um, okay, uh, <clears throat> okay uh, I'm just going to share the QR code for the previous talk and also for this talk as well, if any of you missed it. 